Okay, um, we've uh, up until now been hiding a lot of sins in something we've been calling linear analysis. Uh, you know, if we ever had any ugly terms, we just said, oh, gee, they look nonlinear, and we'll neglect those, right? But uh, what we want to get into now is a little bit of nonlinear theory, and or nonlinear theory and effects, although some things that are in this chapter of Chen, uh, chapter 8, are not really nonlinear. Uh, they really have linear parts to them and so forth and so on. Um, the basic idea is, uh, well, first off, we're going to talk about various types of nonlinear effects, but fundamentally the reason why you have to get into nonlinear effects in plasmas is because if we imagine an instability that's growing out of the noise, it'll grow for some period of time, and when will it saturate? You remember they were exponentially growing. Well, it'll saturate whenever the nonlinear terms become big enough to make it saturate in some way. And so you're almost invariably, at least in unstable plasmas, call it turbulent transport, things like that, you're invariably having to get into nonlinear processes. Now, first, uh, I'd like to just, just mention some various types of nonlinear processes. Um, the first kind, uh, which we've dealt with a little bit, are, let's say already, are problems that cannot be linearized. By which we mean that if you, you sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater and you don't get anything, or you make it too simple or something like that. Some examples of this are if you take the particle flux, we usually write as Fick's law minus d grad n, but often that diffusion coefficient is itself dependent upon the density. And because of that, because it depends upon the density, when you write, you know, a density continuity, uh, a density conservation equation, dn dt plus del dot gamma, you'll get in del dot gamma two powers of density at least. And so, you know, that's clearly nonlinear. Another one is equilibria, which we've dealt with. J cross B is equal to grad P. Uh, and uh, MHD equilibria, magnetohydrodynamic equilibria. Um, if you go back, you'll find we had to balance P plus, uh, roughly speaking, P plus B squared over 2 was a constant. And B squared means some nonlinearity, of course. And then um, the final one that I want to mention here is uh, sheaths at the edge, plasma sheaths at the edge of the plasma. And that's actually what we're going to finally spend most of the, this particular lecture on. But while talking generally here for a moment, I want to mention some other possibilities. Um, and um, those are, for instance, like wave-particle interactions. You remember that when we did uh, linearized analysis, we basically ended up with, in Landau damping, phase velocities of particles being the same, I'm sorry, uh, particle velocities being the same as the phase velocity of the wave. Well, if that's true, uh, just <coughs> Excuse me, imagine a surfer with a wave, he can get caught in the wave. And what that's called in this business is called particle trapping. And then you can also get what are called quasi linear, meaning only second order linear, uh, or sort of like first order uh, theory, uh, which has to do with uh, just lowest order corrections to linear theory and flattens the distribution function uh, locally. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And then you can have nonlinear Landau damping, uh, which means that you beat two waves together. And the beat wave uh, is effectively what traps particles or resonantly interacts with the particles. And you can also have, as we've briefly mentioned, wave echoes which is to say you beat two waves together and interact with the particles. Now that's wave-particle interactions. We can also have wave-wave interactions. Uh, and here 
well, this goes under the general um, description of mode coupling. And you can get uh, out of this then uh, so-called beat waves, uh, the beating of the, of, say, two waves you're interested in. Um, you can get wave breaking, uh, as in the top of a, of a wave coming into an ocean beach breaks. That's a very nonlinear interaction. Similar things happen in plasma waves. And you can get uh, wave uh, parametric decay. Um, the problem with nonlinear processes is there's a tremendous uh, number of them. A final type of nonlinear theory and effects I'd like to mention is plasma turbulence, which can be every bit as rich as fluid turbulence. But since, as you may have noticed, we've had a number of additional physical effects compared to what could happen in a <coughs> neutral fluid, uh, it can get even more complicated. Um, what you really mean by plasma turbulence is in contrast to wave particle and wave wave interactions where you have one or two or three waves interacting with another wave or particles. Here in plasma turbulence what you have in mind is many modes simultaneously. So what we have in mind is then multiple um, mode namely in a sort of statistical, almost statistical limit, although there's considerable debate uh, on precisely that. Uh, and these are all operating simultaneously. Um, you get into, in the plasma turbulence area, uh, renormalization of the equations to take account of normalization uh, to take account of these uh, turbulence effects from many waves, namely turbulent scattering, turbulent diffusion. And you get into then using these sorts of descriptions uh, to talk about or try to talk about turbulent transport. So these are some of the kind of types of nonlinear um, interactions and so forth. But uh, we're only going to really talk about uh, some very brief parts of this, namely sheaths at the edge, which we'll talk about today, uh, some elements of particle trapping and, and quasi-linear, non-linear Landau damping and wave echoes, and then, you know, again, some little elements of, of, of each of these, just to give you an idea of what people are talking about there and perhaps what its connection, difference, et cetera, is to fluid-type approaches. So what I really want to talk about today, then, is the sheath at the edge of a plasma. And this is an intrinsically uh, nonlinear process. Uh, or let's say the equations are, and then we make approximations. I'll actually tell you about the linear approximations mostly today. The basic idea is, you remember we've always said a plasma is quasi-neutral, equal number of ions and electrons. What happens at a wall? You know, plasma comes up, it's up next to a wall. Well, it doesn't obviously have to be neutral at the wall, and even within a few Debye lengths of the wall, it doesn't have to be neutral. It's only in the bulk, remember. So the basic idea is that plasma, this pen is not doing too well. We'll get ourselves another one here, um, is quasi neutral. Um, almost everywhere. And the almost is except perhaps at boundaries. Now, so let's just kind of imagine we had a plasma here and we had a wall. Let's ask how fast do the particles get to the wall. So let's say, what are their free flow rates to a wall? And we calculated before that a, say, particle flux is, you know, NV. 
And if it's just a random particle flux having to do with um, uh, random directions and so forth, it's of order the density times the thermal velocity. Now, question then is what happens, you remember because we're always looking for a potential buildup, do the ions and electrons do anything different? Well, more or less, we expect that Ne is of order Ni. You know, if it's going to be quasi-neutral, it's more or less that way. But we also expect that the electron thermal velocity is of order the square root of the ion to electron mass ratio V thermal ion. It's about 40 times the ion thermal velocity is much greater than V thermal ion. So what this sort of means is that in the sort of somehow the bulk of the plasma here, uh, if we sort of imagine we had some plasma, we sort of start it up and what happens? Well, the electrons all leave, right? Very fast. 40 times faster than the ions. But if they do, there's surely going to be a rather large part positive charge build up because of that. And you can just see qualitatively what's going to happen is that the plasma will get charged positively enough so that relative to some walls that I will put in, okay, because it doesn't matter in the bulk of the plasma, okay, but when I come up to a wall, if the electrons go into a wall, then, you know, I've got a bit of, I've lost the electrons from the plasma. So what happens is we will build up a positive charge, positive space charge, and a positive potential to a sufficient degree so that the electrons can't really run out this fast. Namely, they will be electrostatically confined. So uh, the idea is then electrons uh, flow uh, out too fast, and this uh, leads to positive potential. And this leads to confinement, electrostatic confinement. Of electrons, which builds up to just have the electron current to the wall, or uh, I should do it in terms of gamma E, appro approximately equal to gamma I. Now, so all of this leads to a phi in the plasma greater than the potential of the wall. However, people have a way of doing this. They like to say that the plasma, well, so you can either think of it that, uh, well, let me perhaps just then sketch on here is the easy way. Let's sketch on here what the plasma potential looks like. <coughs> it's going to be high in where the plasma is, okay, and then let's say go down to zero at the wall if the wall was grounded. Um, so this would be a positive potential in the plasma and zero potential at the wall. However, the conventional way that people discuss this problem is they like to say that the plasma is at zero potential and the wall is at some other potential. And if I use that reference system, then effectively I'm just defining the zero of the potential line here. And so what I've done then is I've said that the potential in the plasma is equal to zero and that at the wall is equal to some negative value. And so uh, I'll then sketch sort of how that works on the next page here, and then we'll start doing some of the mathematics of it. So, and I'm going to imagine that I'm over, what I'm, I'm sort of going to do is now extract from this physical picture uh, this region right here and draw that up a little bit in more detail. So what happens is we imagine that we have ourselves a wall here. And then we have some uh, zero of the potential line. Um, 
and so this is going to be phi in this direction. And then far away, uh, you know, oh, sorry, the, the uh, spatial coordinate here is then going to be x, and we'll only talk about um, so-called one-dimensional sheaths. So um, what happens is far away, the plasma potential approaches zero, and it's got to approach some negative value, which we're going to call phi wall. Um, and in between, it's going to uh, vary. Uh, it's got to do something to get there. Now, uh, over what sort of distance would we physically expect the potential to drop? Well, remember, if the length is of order is many to by lengths, okay, I've got to be quasi-neutral, but I can be other than quasi-neutral within a few to by lengths, so, or within a to by length or so. So roughly speaking, what we can expect is we'll have a potential that looks like this. Now, it turns out that it really, it, it kind of curves in like this, and people define uh, a certain region, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, as a pre-sheath region here. Pre-sheath meaning it's a connection between the bulk plasma here and a sheath, and the, the sheath itself region uh, is then this region here. So this is called the sheath region. And we expect, uh, again, this distance to be uh, delta x of order a uh, few uh, divide lengths. The pre-sheath region can be of the order of the mean coll collisional mean-free path or sources uh, in the plasma or so forth, depending upon the details of what's causing um, that particular uh, sheath. Okay, so now what we would sort of like to know are things like um, how big is this wall potential? Well, how could we determine that? Well, physically, you remember the idea was that we were going to have ions just free-flowing to the wall, uh, but the electrons, this potential is supposed to be big enough to confine them. So roughly speaking, what we have is we have ions actually get accelerated into the wall, but electrons are, for the most part, getting um, reflected off of this potential barrier. So if we could balance the electro, we, what we really want to do is find out how big do I have to make the wall potential so as to balance the electron and ion currents. Okay? So uh, let's say balance... electron and ion currents to the wall. Currents are charge flows, of course. How big is the current to the wall? Well, sort of the current oops, is equal to some value, which I won't really worry about, alpha is some numerical constant, times sort of NV thermal, that's its random velocity. And then it's ordinarily, you would say, well, it's not a very big difference, but uh, because we've got this potential in here and we're trying to reflect the electrons, we better use the so-called Boltzmann distribution, e to the minus q phi over t, particularly for electrons. So let's say j current is sort of like that. So the electron current I should actually put in E in here, is equal to then the N naught, E, which is the density of electrons way back in the bulk of the plasma, times E V thermal E, and then the Q is minus E for the electrons. And so this just becomes E to the plus E phi wall, because the difference in potential between the center of the plasma and the wall is just phi wall over T sub E. 
Ji, the ion current to the wall, it, it's sort of the ion current is, is mostly determined way back here. And so it'll just become n naught i e v thermal ion. Maybe I put in an alpha here, by the way, but anyway. But the idea is that I could put in an exponential factor, but all that really represents is an acceleration of the particles. They go to higher speed as they get accelerated by this potential. As they do so, we'll later talk about the fact that their density in decreases because as they get accelerated, their their dense well, n v is a constant in a fluid, and so it's going to um, n has to decrease if if v increases. So roughly speaking, this turns out to still be the case. So if I now equate j e is approximately equal to j i, and then just write down these two formulas, I get alpha n naught e e v thermal e e to the e phi wall over T e is approximately equal to alpha n naught i i, well, e v thermal ion. And now, um, I'm sorry, actually what I did is I put in here e to the e phi wall over T i, but it um, doesn't make too much difference. Anyway, um, and so this becomes e to the minus, eh, minus uh, e phi wall over ti. And so if I now just cancel out common factors, alpha, density, and e, but the thermal velocities are, of course, different. So what you get out of this is that e to the minus 2e phi wall over t and I'm going to assume that Te is of order Ti. Um, so we have e to the minus e, 2e phi wall over Te is approximately equal to uh, V, should be V thermal I over V thermal E. Now I've got to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Here. Oh, sorry. It's, well, hmm. oh, yeah, okay, no, it's, um, actually the way I've written it is V thermal E over V thermal I, and the problem is that phi wall has to be negative, okay? Uh, so if I take the logarithm of both sides of this and realize that this is approximately the ion to electron mass ratio, then uh, if I take the logarithm, I get m minus 2e phi wall over te is approximately equal to 1 half the logarithm of mi over me. And so if I uh, work this out, this gives me that e phi wall over Te. So I'm just measuring the potential in units of the electron temperature is approximately equal to minus one quarter of the logarithm of Mi over Me. <coughs> and it turns out that's minus two. Um, pragmatically, I can tell you that uh, as I go through this, I would uh, there's a little bit of variability in these calculations, and I'm going to, depending upon exactly what you assume for the incoming ions, if instead of what I just did, I left out this exponential factor on the ions, then what you would find is what I'm making changes on here, which are a little hard to see, so I'll choose another color. But anyway, um, um, and that would take away that one half, and this would become a two, and then frankly, this would go to about um, minus, it turns out it's about 3.7. So depending upon what you do uh, for your assumptions of how the incoming ions distribute themselves and how they get accelerated by the potential or not, um, you find one of these other relations. But the fundamental point that we want to get at here is that the wall potential is two or three times, four times, 
uh, the electron temperature. Fundamentally, what that says is we can't let the average electron go to the wall. We have to have a potential greater than kT, a couple three times kT, in order to cut off the electron distribution and not, not let all the electrons um, go to the wall. Okay, so now that's sort of a general magnitude. Next thing we'd like to do is get some, ha some handle on the shape of the potential distribution out in here. And um, so to do that, let's call that sort of a sheath uh, structure. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so how do we <coughs> get at that? Um, so let's sheath um, structure. Eh, let's take this away. Um, and what we mean by that is phi of x. Um, what, we, what do we need, let's put it that way, is the, the first question. Uh, how are we going to calculate the potential variation here? Well, as usual, we'll, I mean, it's electrostatics, okay, and so we use Poisson's equation, uh, Gauss's law and then Poisson's equation. And then we're going to need the charge density. So we're going to need something for the electron density distribution function as a function of that potential and the ion density distribution. Okay? So let's uh, work those out a bit. First, let's work on the ions. Um, we're going to assume that they are a fluid. So let's call this the fluid assumption. And as such, uh, density conservation means that uh, we would write down just, you know, dn dt plus del dot nv is equal to zero. Um, now, for the problem at hand, uh, you know, sort of some equilibrium, we'll take away that term. Uh, and so, and, and make this into 1D. And so what this uh, equation becomes, uh, just because we've been treating it in one dimension, is D by DX N VX is equal to zero. So what that tells us is then that N of X density is a function of spatial position times the flow velocity of the species is a function of X is equal to a constant. And what is that constant? Well, we will call that constant n naught u naught, where n naught and u naught will be the, um, the density and flow velocity of the ions coming in over at this end. Okay, So it's just n naught and u naught. Are, there's an ion flow into this, it turns out. OK. Um, so now, uh, but there's a little more we can do with this. Uh, next, let's use energy conservation. And we could write out the flow, flow energy equation and dot it and so forth and so on. But we'll just basically say that the uh, kinetic energy, uh, mi vx squared n naught, uh, is equal to one half uh, ni, I'm sorry, well, yeah. Uh, well, why did I put one over n? One half ni mi u naught squared uh, minus uh, q phi n naught. Yeah. Um, and so if we eliminate all the extraneous n naughts I just stuck in there, we can then solve that the flow velocity Vx of x is then, oh, and this is equal to some energy if we wanted it. Um, but in our particular case, we just want to write it that Vx squared is then the square root of u naught squared minus 2e phi of x over mi. So, this has the property then that if I start out with 
some velocity off to the side here as the ions come in. Okay, the potential goes down. This goes down, uh, or phi goes negative. The velocity goes up. And then because the velocity goes up and n, n times v is constant, uh, then the density must go down. So what we find is that then n of x is equal to n naught u naught divided by v x of x, which is then equal to um, n naught divided by the square root of 1 minus 2 e over uh, phi of x divided by m i u naught squared. Now, that was the ion density. Um, for quasi-neutrality, we, of course, need to do a little something with the electrons as well. So let's next look at what we do for the electrons. Should we use a fluid approximation for the electrons? Well, no, what we're really counting on is that a potential holds them back. So we're really counting on them having a Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution. That is to say they follow uh, Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution for adiabatic particles. Namely, that n sub e of x is equal to n naught e to the e phi over e. So now what we need to do, we have the electron density and the ion density. We want to calculate the self-consistent potential through Poisson's equation. So let's write down Poisson's equation. Namely, we have minus del squared phi is equal to rho over epsilon naught. And that's equal to 1 over epsilon naught, well, e over epsilon naught times ni of x minus ne of x. Or we'll take the minus sign over at the other side. And so uh, we can write this then as d squared phi by dx squared is equal to e n naught over epsilon times e to the e phi over t e. That'll be the electron distribution function. And then minus 1 over the square root of 1 minus 2 e phi of x divided by m i u naught squared. And that's the ion distribution function. Now, uh, we, we can, um, well, I'll, I'll write this and then I'll come back and really do it again. Um, the potential, remember, we sort of more or less found that uh, it was normalized to the electron temperature. So E phi over T, we expected to be some function, but some function of order unity. Uh, phi wall was two or three times the electron temperature. So what's convenient to do is to define some quantity chi, which is convenient to confuse the notation, as E phi of x over Te, which means that it is a function of x. And then when we do that, then we'd have to introduce here E over Te. And so this would become E squared over Te out in front, and that's 1 over the Debye length squared. So what that means, then, is that we can, therefore, write our equation as d squared chi by dx squared is equal to 1 over, sorry, lambda Debye squared times e to the chi minus 1 over the square root of. And now uh, this is then 1 minus 
and E phi, now I need a Ti, and um, so we can write this as just T E, um, 2 T E, sorry, over M I U naught squared times chi. So that's the equation that governs the potential. How do I go about solving that equation? How about it's nonlinear and in general it's kind of difficult? Um, e to the chi is a nonlinear function, right? I mean, just expand it in a Taylor series. 1 plus chi, you're all okay, but then plus chi squared over 2, plus chi cubed over 3 factorial, and so forth and so on. Likewise, this is a nonlinear function of chi. So it's del squared chi is equal to two, the difference of two different nonlinear functions of chi. How do you solve such an equation? Well, there aren't often solutions to nonlinear equations, so we often have to uh, do a little something to kind of guess a solution or approximate a solution or something. So what do we always do when we punt? Linearize, right? So at least we ought to understand what the linear approximation is, and then in a moment we'll come back and discuss how you deal with it a little bit uh, nonlinearly. In a moment may actually be next time. But anyway, um, so what I want to do is now come back to basically this form uh, and linearize the equation so that we can get um, some idea of how things go. So if we linearize... Um, Poisson's equation. Uh, I guess I left it back in the form right here. So first, let's, let's just write it as d squared phi by dx squared is equal to 1 over the Debye length squared. Did I want to leave it in that form? Yeah. Uh, and then e to the e phi over te, and then minus 1 over square root of 1 minus 2e phi over mi u naught squared. And what I need to then do is to linearize what I really mean by that is I I'll want to take that e phi over te is much less than 1. Okay? Um, <laughs> uh, you're right, it's not dimensionally correct because I already took the t over e. Right. Uh, this should have been chi, but I'll swindle it by putting te over e back over here. And then I'll have kept it dimensionally correct. Yeah, good point. Okay, so now I need to expand e to the e phi over te. And, of course, expanding for small e phi over t, this is just 1 plus e phi over te plus and so forth. And maybe I'll just specifically say plus e phi over te squared. And likewise, I want to expand that last term, um, 1 minus 1, maybe 2 e phi over m i u naught squared. And this is approximately equal to 1. And then minus minus, that becomes plus. Sorry. Um, yeah. uh, e, well, I, I want to get it into a form of e phi over te, it turns out. So I'll put it into that form. Um, I've got a 2 down there. I expand the square root, and I get a half, and that cancels the 2. So you get a 2 over 2. Uh, and then what I'm left with is te over mi u naught squared. And, of course, plus again, order e phi over te squared terms. Okay, so uh, now if we then subtract these two, so, okay, we'll just take minus, 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 so forth. Um, then what we get is that d squared phi by dx squared, the, the two ones obviously cancel. 
um, we get d squared phi by dx squared is equal to t sub e over e lambda to i squared. In the first term, we get e phi over t e. From the last term, we get uh, minus e phi over t e, or the other part, but with an additional factor t e over m i u naught squared. And then we, of course, get order e phi t e phi over t squared type terms, which I'm neglecting. And now, um, the e phi over t factors go away, and what our simple equation becomes then, linearized equation is d squared phi by dx squared is equal to 1 over the Debye length squared, sorry, phi over the Debye length squared, times 1 minus What's this TE over MI U naught squared mean? Well, this is something like the electron temperature compared to the ion flow energy. But there's a different way of writing it. Let's remember that we defined the sound speed for if the ions were at very low temperature as TE over MI. So what we can actually make this TE over MI uh, u naught squared is the sound speed squared divided by u naught squared. What's the ratio of the ion flow velocity to the ion sound speed? What would we ordinarily call that? Ratio of a flow velocity to a, to a sound speed. It's a Mach number. Right? <laughs> so we'll define a Mach number as u naught over v sound squared, v sound and therefore, we will just write this as uh, 1 over m squared. So our equation then has become d squared phi by dx squared is equal to uh, phi. Um, yeah, well, OK. Uh, lambda to by squared times 1 minus 1 over m squared. What are the solutions of that equation? Well, they might be exponential or they might be oscillatory, right? Depending upon what the sign of that quantity is. Okay. So if we had Mach number less than 1, then we would have 1 minus 1 over m squared is greater than 0. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, less than 0. And what kind of solutions do we get then? Well, then we need the e to the i, e to the i something. Okay. So that's e to the i k dot k x in this case, or e to the i x over lambda. And so this is oscillatory solutions. I didn't, that wasn't kind of what we were looking for, if you remember. I mean, we had this conception of we, we wanted to have you know, a, a smoothly varying sheath. But in fact, it's possible that, that uh, you have this solution. Um, so these would be oscillatory solutions. And, but, but really, it's kind of an artifact of our model. And so what would happen is you could imagine you'd have oscillatory solutions or something. But it turns out that if you add collisions or some form of dissipation, um, which we did not have in our problem, uh, that smooths out this, these bumps. So really, the solution we want is when the Mach number is greater than 1, then 1 minus 1 over m squared is greater than 0. And then what our solutions look like is like phi is equal to phi wall times e to the minus x uh, over the Debye length, okay, and then times the square root of 1 minus 1 over m squared. And so... Um, these solutions are the are the ones with the desired form. 
namely, if I make a plot here, uh, we have our um, phi as a function of x, and we have our value here, phi wall, and uh, these are the sort of exponentially falling solutions. However, along the way, we had to make the approximation that we were, you know, less than e, uh, te over e. That is to say that the potential was rather small. So, in fact, this particular solution, this approximate linearized solution, is really only valid in a relatively narrow range, namely sort of around in here. So, But it, it gives you some feel for what it is that's required. However, one of the key aspects of this is that if you now ask, well, what's the condition for having a well-behaved sheath, namely not the oscillatory one, um, you end up with a criterion which is called the Bohm sheath criterion, which is that the Mach number of the ions coming in is greater than 1. So this is Bohm sheath criterion. Mach number is greater than 1 um, for, let's call it well-behaved, non-oscillatory solutions. Can't seem to spell today. Solutions. And another way of writing that is that the incoming ion flow velocity has to be greater than the sound speed, which is root TE over MI. So this is known as the Bohm sheath criterion, and it's just a basically a condition on more or less the solution of the analysis. Uh, and it says that, again, the ions have to be coming into the sheath region here with a velocity u naught ion, which is, with a little bit of acceleration, okay, due to the potential, which is greater than um, the electron well, then the sound speed, that flow velocity is greater than the sound speed. Um, what about the growing solution? Um, well, we could look at the growing solution, and uh, it would sort of uh, grow away from the wall, um, I guess, this way. Um, it, it, I guess I just reject it because far away from the wall, uh, it's becoming infinite whereas I, I have a chosen the boundary conditions here such that when I go far away from the wall, I want zero. So it doesn't match my infinite boundary condition, which I implicitly put in. Yeah. So I've imposed you know, a boundary condition that this solution phi should go to zero far away from the wall. There, there's a certain element when you do this of you do pieces of the problem as opposed to the whole problem. And if you write out the whole problem, um, the problem is that you can't solve all the regions simultaneously. And I'll next time talk about how we solve that um, by a more general procedure. Uh, turns out to be indirect and numerically done primarily. Uh, and then you can get such solutions. Pragmatically, in the linearized form, I just impose the boundary condition that phi has to vanish far from the wall so as to avoid that. Now, one little tidbit of what we can do is we can sort of say, well, uh, I don't know why I have TE over 2 here, but anyway. Oh, over E it should have been. Um, so our solution is valid sort of whenever E phi is less than TE over E, but you can also show that if the ions were just being accelerated in by some potential, you'd need a little bit of potential to accelerate them, and they have to go a little ways, like TE over 2, before they're accelerated enough. So there's only a very narrow range of validity uh, for this particular calculation, it turns out. So, um, but it's, I think it's indicative that um, of, of the fact that the 
the potential distribution function is more or less exponentially decaying away from the wall. And how fast does it die off? I mean, over how long a distance does it go? Well, first off, it, it was, you remember the wall potential was of the order of a few, two to four, times uh, the electron temperature. So I'm going to have to decay a few Debye lengths for that reason. It's not really quite exponential in here, but, you know. Um, and then I'll have to go a little further because my Mach number is really not too much, a little bit greater than 1, 1.2, 1.3. So when, you, when all is said and done, this might be of the order of 3 to 10 Debye lengths, just as a, as a rough number as far as the magnitude goes. Okay, so we'll pause here for a moment, and then we'll uh, talk about, it turns out, Langmuir probes, uh, as, which are basically an application of sheath potentials around a, um, around a probe. Uh, anyway, and we'll talk about that in just a minute.